In today's episode, we are going over a case study of a weightlifter who gets good old cervical radiculopathy. Let's do this. This is part three in our series of cervical radiculopathy. If you missed the first part, I recommend going back in the show notes, in the description and checking out part one and part two before you proceed. So we wrap up the first initial evaluation. The patient goes away. They come back in one week. What's the second visit like? So the first thing as I ask questions about how things are going, right? What's really cool is that she had dramatically increased her range of motion within her neck, right? Her pain and symptoms had dramatically lessened, which is phenomenal, right? And she also had an improvement in her strength. So she could actually move through a full range of motion. It didn't look great, but she can get all the way overhead with some compensation at this point and a lot of concentration, right? And that's a great thing because what we found is that her strength actually improved from visit one to visit two. We don't have an emergency situation anymore. I don't feel like she has to get to the doctor right away, right? I still recommend she goes and sees the doc, but I'm not going because I think there's an emergency situation. So after we get a little gauge on how she's progressing, the first thing I focus on are the manual therapies. And like I said, we focused on some upper trapezius and levator scapulae, soft tissue work, I like to use some tools, some cupping. I also like some needling. We worked on some cervical lateral glides. We did some distraction mobilizations. We did some nerve glides. We did some prone thoracic manipulation work, as well as some prone cervical PAs and some prone cervical unilateral PAs. And now I've got a free guide for you today. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet to cervical radiculopathy. We go over all the fundamental basics for diagnosis and treatment of cervical radiculopathy. It's an eight page PDF, and I'll take you from a novice to an expert extremely quickly. I'm gonna leave a link in the description so you can go ahead and download that right now and get learning. In terms of the exercises that we gave to the patient this session, we continued all of the daily exercises that she did on her initial evaluation. So those movements didn't change. However, I really wanted to get her on a more robust strengthening program. So essentially we got her on two day program, three exercises each day, right? We focused on general upper body strength training. We focused on strengthening for the neck, focused on strength of the scapular exercises, and we put extra emphasis on those weak areas. Okay. So day one, the three exercises we had, we're dumbbell press to a prop. So think about doing a Turkish get up, right? But not going through the full range of motion. Second exercise was a plank position where you perform a T. So great scapular stability on one side with a T. So great scapular stability exercise where you're planking on one arm while the other arm raises up into a T position. And lastly, isometric band step outs. We did these in all directions. So essentially you have a band around your head attached to a rig or something stable and you step out to the side and you get an isometric contraction for whichever direction you're facing. So we did it with the band facing to the side. So you do some scaling strength and then you move the band to another position where maybe you're facing the band. Now you're working the cervical extensors, extensors. If we flip and face the opposite direction and step out, now it's gonna be working the front side of the neck. Day two, I prescribed a dumbbell scaption. Couldn't use very much weight, but just a little bit, right? Wanna to start to strengthen that deltoid a little bit. We also gave a reverse crawl. So on hands and knees and kind of a bear position and taking steps backwards, working on protraction, protraction, great scapular stability exercise, a little bit of core work. And if you think about the neck position, we're also working on the deep neck extensor endurance. And again, the same band step outs on day two. Another thing I'm big on in my patients with cervical radiculopathy is trying to get some good objective measurements, right? What's a little bit scary and not great is that the majority of folks, when they're doing a neuro examination, they're just testing your strength, right? With your hands. Okay. To me, this is akin to, let's say you're trying to weigh someone, right? And as opposed to putting them on a scale, you try to pick them up. You're like, oh, that's 150 pounds. Well, we're not great at, at basically figuring out how much someone weighs by picking them up, right? We're also not great at figuring out how much strength someone has just by feeling their resistance, right? How much they can push against us. So it's really good to use a handheld dynamometer to get some real numbers, some accurate numbers, so you can gauge your progress over the course of time. And that helps you direct the exercise you give to your patients, right? So we use the handheld dynamometer to see just how weak she was from side to side. And we tested external rotation, abduction, as well as prone T, just because those are the movements that were mostly involved. There was a little bit of weakness, internal rotation, elbow flexion, but it wasn't too bad. Uh, and it was actually improving pretty rapidly. So I wasn't as concerned about getting a good measurement on that. And what we found is that there was a 76% asymmetry in abduction, which actually be pretty huge, right? So she only has, let's say 25% of the strength on the involved side compared to the uninvolved side. 
And the same thing went for the prone T. So she had a 72.5% asymmetry, so huge asymmetry. And then from an external rotation perspective, it was 47% asymmetry. So about half the strength left to right. Obviously, that's still not good, but the big heavy hitters, the ones we really want to focus on, probably going to be the deltoid and maybe the posterior deltoid and some of those scapular uh, muscles because right now they're pretty dang weak. And just know that it's really, really important to make sure that you test finger strength just because if you don't have finger strength, there's no way you're going to be able to like this video and subscribe to the channel, which I highly, highly recommend. So in future visits, how do we advance her home exercise program? So for one, we just made it more robust. So we added more exercises and I gave her a third day. If you think about folks like to train in the gym, they usually have multiple days they train throughout the course of the week. They don't do the same exact thing on each day. So my goal is to give them a program that very closely resembles what they already do. I think this is good for a variety of reasons. So for one, we're actually doing what they like to do. So they're gonna be much more likely to do this, right? If I give them exercise they currently enjoy, they're much more likely to be compliant. The other piece is I don't want to add anything additional to their schedule, right? Because if I start asking them to perform additional lifts in the evening, in the morning, it's really hard to change your habits on a regular basis. So if I can have the program closely resemble what the patient is already doing, and just put those exercises directly into the current training program, I think that's a big win-win. So on day one, we added in some plank position shoulder taps, as well as some face pulls. On day two, we added in some different variations of face pulls, as well as some bent over rear delt flies with dumbbells. On day three, we threw in some dumbbell lateral raises. So as you can see with this strength training program, we want it to start looking like an actual training program. That's important. But the other piece is we're starting to really target those weak areas. I know that deltoid is weak. I want to get that thing stronger. I'm going to overemphasize strengthening that. And largely this program was performed three days per week. So you have a day one, a day two, and a day three. You perform this on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And on the off days, we can still do those daily home exercise program exercises that we got at the initial evaluation. If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now I'm actually a really big fan of education and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want, which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal at the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important they understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better, they go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, Rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seat of reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. Second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later. 
So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. And now back to your learning. So next, let's actually go over what a physical therapy treatment session looks like, right? So I recommended 30 minute sessions for this patient. One of the reasons why we recommended 30 minute sessions were a, an hour is just going to be a little bit more expensive, right? Currently she wasn't working, so she wasn't making a lot of income. So we made those sessions a little bit shorter for her. The other piece is that she's a smart strength coach and trainer. I don't think that I need to watch her do all of her exercises. I actually think that's a little bit of a waste of her time and mine. So if I write her the right exercises, make sure she does them right in the clinic. I'm pretty confident that she's going to do them at home. Okay. Hence a shorter session is probably okay with this patient. So when the patient first walks in, I like to check in with them. How are things going? Have you made progress from last week? Are you having additional pain, right? Checking in, see how things are going. I also like to ask questions about whether or not the patient feels like they're moving in the right direction. Basically, this is a question to ask more about the patient's needs and whether or not we're satisfying those, right? Because oftentimes as a physical therapist, you might think you're doing a bang up job, but the patient maybe doesn't believe that. So it's important that we understand what's going on within the patient's mind so we can really meet those needs. And lastly, I try to ask this with most of my patients at the start of each session. What are your goals for the day? Is there anything you really want to focus on? This is helpful because it helps to guide what we do for the day, right? Um, it's also important that I let the patient know what I plan on doing because oftentimes you come in, you expect to do one thing with the patient, but they're like, hey, I really want you to look at, let's say, my elbow or my neck, and that's really bothering me. Or I really like that manual technique where you did X because that helped me out a ton. So it kind of helps direct the treatment, and I think it's beneficial for the patient because it helps to establish a little bit more rapport uh, via empathy. Next, I do a quick assessment. Let's check out that abduction. Maybe I'll strength test a little bit, see if that strength is coming back. Check the range of motion at the neck. How's that rotation feeling? How's extension? So get an idea of what's still limited and what we have to continue working on. Helps direct my treatment with the patient over the course of the session in the future. You can also check some of the special tests. One good special test to maybe check is the upper limb neural tension test. Are we making progress here? We can check the range of motion and given how irritated that uh, nerve is, maybe we give more advanced nerve stretch exercises if they're progressing from that perspective. And after our check-in and our assessment, I go right into manual therapy treatments. So the initial check-in is going to take about two to three minutes, the assessment, another two to three minutes. And then I spend around 15 minutes or so with manual therapies. Obviously, this is going to change based on the person, based on how many therapies you want to get through. But at least for me, that's about how long I spend. I start off with some soft tissue mobilizations. Usually I do some cupping, I do some needling, I do some tool work, I use my hands a little bit. From there, I move on to joint mobilizations. So we flip onto the patient's back, we're doing some cervical lateral glides, we're focused on some rotation glides. From here, we'll do some nerve glides, we'll do some nerve glides with some distraction. We can flip from this position and focus on some thoracic mobility. So a thoracic spine thrust manipulation, and then we can do some central PAs in the neck as well as some unilateral PAs. After we finish up with manual therapies, we got another 10 minutes left or so. And at this point we go over any new exercise. So basically if I think we're ready to advance, we'll go out in the gym, we'll try those movements. I'll coach them up, make sure the technique is good, make sure the exercises are appropriate. And with the last little bit of time that we have, we sit down, we type it up into the home exercise program. I use Google Docs for all of my home exercise programs. Make sure the patient is on board, ask them if they have any questions, maybe outline the next steps from a physical therapy perspective, and then send them on their way. So our initial plan was to see this patient once a week for four to six weeks, and then at that point, do intermittent visits every month or two to gauge her progress and just update her plan, right? So... This often sounds great on paper and then in reality doesn't always work out. So essentially she had more intermittent visits. I actually only saw her for a total of five visits. The first four visits were over the span of about two months. She was busy. She had a lot of stuff going on. She had some traveling to do. And, as, and after that fourth visit, she was supposed to come in in a couple of weeks and she just didn't. And I get it. Life gets busy and she was feeling better. I'm okay with that, right? And I actually didn't end up seeing her again until almost the year mark. So best laid plans don't always go perfectly. But at the end of the day, I think we actually did a pretty good job helping her. And if a patient doesn't follow the plan exactly, I'm okay with that. It's their decision, right? I'm here to serve them and guide them. 
if they feel like they got what they needed out of me and they can do this work on their own, then awesome. I've done my job. So I'm trying to teach them how to take care of themselves, shift that locus of control, right? So again, we had five total visits. The majority of the visits were 30 minute sessions with an hour initial evaluation. I think our last visit was kind of a reevaluation because I saw her a year later. What we ended up doing was just checking out her strength and then giving her new exercise to focus on. And her strength really did improve quite a bit. In terms of external rotation, she was nearly symmetrical. So just a couple pounds of force off left to right. In terms of abduction strength, she was still a decent amount limited. So on her uninvolved side, she had 30 pounds of force produced. And on her involved side, she had 26 pounds produced, right? So around a four pound difference. So a decent amount different side to side in abduction, but substantially better, right? She had a 75% asymmetry when she started. This is around a five to 10% asymmetry, right? Way, way better. In terms of her T strength, that was also still limited. So she was at a 9.4 on her involved side and a 12.2 on the uninvolved side. So about three pounds, two to three pounds off strength wise and still limited. So at least in my mind, what this means to me is that a, it takes a long time to get your strength back after cervical radiculopathy. I'll tell you what, this is one of the most disciplined patients you're ever going to work with, right? So if these super disciplined patients at the year mark are still dealing with substantial differences side to side, right? Then those people that don't like to exercise, you know, a good chance they're going to be even weaker at that year mark. So like I said, this patient is a strength coach, right? So I don't need to write a very specific strength training program for her. She already, already can do that. So as opposed to giving her a super specific strength program, I just give her recommendations in a template format, right? So generally speaking, I said once a week, you should be doing some sort of single arm pulling, right? So it might be a dumbbell row or single arm pull down. Now, we just said that rowing was a little bit better off than pressing. So my recommendation was to put a little bit more focus on pressing than pulling. And I gave her a variety of movements that would fit the bill. So things like landmine press, dumbbell overhead press or steep incline press or some sort of single arm press laying flat like a cable press or a dumbbell press cable press you would be standing like a punch press right but a couple exercises where you're pressing overhead and maybe one exercise you're pressing horizontal i also recommended two to three times per week full can shoulder abduction like i said Good old abduction was most limited at the start. It's most limited now. Let's keep on working on it. We reevaluated her nerve mobility. And at this point, she was actually most limited in the ulnar nerve. So I ended up giving her an ulnar nerve stretch and glide. And I also gave her a more intense median nerve stretch because she was still a little bit limited, but not too bad. So I gave her something that was a little bit more aggressive, something you wouldn't give your patient at their initial evaluation, right? In terms of her cervical range of motion, it looked great. She had no problems there, right? So keep in mind, she was extremely limited in the beginning, right? And at the year mark, no limitation whatsoever in range of motion, no limitation from a pain perspective, sensation, all that stuff has returned. The only thing that didn't was her strength. So our program should obviously reflect that. So now you know how I like to treat my patients with cervical radiculopathy. You still need to know some basics about cervical radiculopathy. What am I talking about? You need to know how to diagnose your patients. You want to know things about, let's say, prevalence, anatomy. What are the best treatments for cervical radiculopathy? Should you be doing exercise, manual therapies? Should your patients consider things like injections or surgeries? When should you recommend things like injections or surgery with your patients? What are medical red flags? All of that good stuff. I have a complete guide. It's a masterclass for cervical radiculopathy. I'm going to leave a link in the corner. Definitely go check that out, and I will see you in that video. And lastly, thank you, thank you so much for joining me today with this lesson on cervical radiculopathy. You truly allowed me to do what I love for a living. I love educating. I love learning about this stuff. I love sharing. And I wouldn't be able to do it without folks like yourself, so thank you. If you're watching this on YouTube, please, please, please hit that like button. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy this. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please give me a five out of five rating. It helps tremendously. And lastly, if you want to go that next step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. So Insiders is like Netflix for physical therapists and coaches working with painful folks in the gym. You've got access to 100 plus webinars, ebooks, and courses. More recently, I've been taking all of my best content 
from YouTube. I've been taking out all the ads. I've been organizing it in a really step-by-step -step fashion in an entire course so you can easily go through it. And I add additional pieces to this to enhance your learning, right? So I just finished up my lateral ankle sprain course. And one of the big things I add to this was a protocol. So essentially, what do you do week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, six, seven, eight? You know me, I like working with athletes. I like working with really fit and strong people. So it's going to be a lot more robust than your typical protocol. Also, you have access to me. So inside of insiders, you can leave a comment and I'll get right back to you. I also have physical therapy CEUs inside of insiders. So if you take the course, Essential Coaches Series, get a bunch of CEUs. And what's even better is you can start for just $1. After that, it's $25 per month. It's going to be the cheapest CEUs you can get. It's by far the highest value program that I offer at the cheapest price. So head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders to get started. I'll also leave a link in the show notes where you can check it out.